amen, 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 again, amen, praise God, it's so good to be here in the house of the Lord one time, to worship, one more time, to worship the Lord God in spirit and in truth, to be able to uh, pray with and for the saints of God, the people of God, and those persons that are going through something amen it's so good to be able to participate in this ministry this unique ministry that god has given us amen i know that you uh may not ever be called pastor deacon uh elder bishop trustee but god amen amen will uh you still has empowered uh, each of us to engage in this ministry of prayer to uh, to lift up persons that are going through something to stand in the gap for someone amen you don't have to be an ordained clerical minister to do this all you have to do is to be someone that's willing to trust god uh and to depend on god and to rely on god and to see him do amen the the absolute amazing uh in your presence amen amen it's been seven days amen and a lot has gone on in seven days we're going to do our best to lift up each and every prayer request that comes our way but before we do we're going to open up with a word of prayer amen and after that we'll move right into our morning devotional amen here let's uh open up with a word of prayer dear father god creator of the heavens and the earth god we come to you right this very instant thanking you god for keeping us and sustaining us for another seven days another week god god in fact in those seven days you could have let anything happen to us you could have let us get hurt, harmed, and even killed. But God, you saw fit to it to protect us, to watch over us, to give us life, to grant us life, to sustain life, to maintain life, to increase life, to elevate life, to protect life. And God, we thank you for that. Father God, it's time for your prayer warriors to come together once again to touch and agree in prayer, God, on those things, God, that you will have us touch and agree on. God, persons are hurting this morning. Persons, God, are suffering. Persons, God, have questions. Persons, God, are scratching their heads, trying to figure out why things are happening the way they are. God, we pray right now that your Holy Spirit will be so present on this call that as we're praying, as we're lifting up the prayer requests, as we're trusting you, God, that, God, you are moving in their situations, you are moving in their lives, you are moving amongst uh, the midst of them, God. And God, you are providing people the relief they need. You're providing the freedom that they so des desperately want. And God, you are, you are serving as a bomb that relieves the pain and the suffering. God, God, do what only you can do. Create God as well as fits God. Repair God as well as enable God. Restore God as well as re reconcile. God, do everything you need to do so that when it's said and done, we all can join together in one big choir and give you the praise, the honor, and the glory you so richly deserve. Father God, again, let your Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide on this call as we continue to move forward in faith. It's in your son's mighty, matchless, marvelous, and magnificent name we do pray. Amen. <clears throat> amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, amen. Good morning, everyone that's joining us on Facebook Live. Amen. Why don't you do this while I'm going through the devotional this morning? Why don't you start typing in your prayer requests that you have for our call this morning? Amen. Uh, use take advantage of the box down at the bottom of the screen. Uh, type in your prayer request, and when we get to the prayer praise pr uh, the prayer section of our call, we will lift up those prayer requests. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, our scriptorial focus for our devotional comes from Genesis chapter twenty-two, verses nine and ten. Genesis chapter twenty-two, verses nine and ten. I will read from the New Revised Standard Version of the Scripture. When Abraham and his son Isaac came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. He bound Isaac and laid his son on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill Isaac. Thus far, the word of God. <clears throat> Amen. The title of our devotional this morning is Family Drama Part 2. Subtitle, Mama or Daddy, Why Did You Do That to Me? Family Drama, Part 2, subtitled, Mama or Daddy, Why Did You Do That to Me? Quite often, we read the first 19 verses of Genesis chapter 22 as a celebrated demonstration of faith. 
There we witness Abraham, the first Israelite patriarch, make the ultimate sacrifice that a parent could make. The Lord our God tested Abraham to ascertain who the brother loved more, the gift giver or the gift. He instructed Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac as a burnt offering. Abraham responded obediently to the Lord. He took Isaac to the top of Mount Moriah, built an altar, bound his son, and laid him on that altar. Abraham then grabbed his knife and attempted to carry out the sacrifice. Just before he could, the angel of the Lord appeared, stopping Abraham from killing Isaac. Witnessing Abraham's unyielding and unwavering obedience. Amen. Uh, the Lord then promised Abraham that he would bless Abraham with so many offspring that they couldn't be numbered if anyone tried. To the average person and the average Christian, this story establishes the definitive model of faith. A man of God is charged of putting everything near and dear to him on the line just so that our God can know for certain that this man trusted the Lord completely. We're so accustomed to celebrating this story as an example of unswerving faithfulness that we don't even try to understand this story differently. We act like the only character we can experience this story through is Abraham. We completely forget that there is another eyewitness to this incident. That's Isaac, Abraham's son. He was there too. And I'm willing to bet anyone that he understood this incident in an, enti in, in an entirely different light than his father did or we presently do. If we had to view this incident through Isaac's eyes, I bet you that this sacrifice looked more like a callous and loveless attempt to kill him. If we will recall, last week our Heavenly Father began a new devotional series entitled Family Drama. The purpose of this devotional series is to help us understand how the decisions we make and the actions we take today can have long-lasting effects and long-ranging consequences for our families long after we're dead. In the first devotional series, the Lord God revealed to us that the decision to expel one son from Abraham's household while keeping the other son planted seeds of discord, division, and dissension that will continue to bear fruit fruit down to Abraham's great-grandchildren. This week, God our Father wants to help us understand how Isaac could dispassionately choose Esau over Jacob. He witnessed his father Abraham dispassionately choose God over him. And if God rewarded his father for choosing him over his son, then why should Isaac ever worry about God not also rewarding him because he chose one son over the other? I can hear Isaac saying to us, let's not forget that Elohim blessed my father after he kicked my brother Ishmael and his mother out of our home. Why should I stress over what Elohim will do to me if I choose Esau over J Jacob? <clears throat> this is where we are today. This is what the Lord our God wants us to chew on this morning. This is a difficult topic to deal with, but God our Father declares that we must deal with it because there are persons whose parents did far worse to them than what Abraham did to Isaac. These persons are broken today because of the decisions that their parents made about them and the action these same parents took towards them. Our first point this morning, amen, is that Abraham's actions appear to Isaac to be a willful violation of the parent-child relationship. Abraham's actions appear to Isaac to be a willful violation of the parent-child relationship. Putting ourselves into Isaac's shoes, experiencing what he did with his father Abraham at the top of Mount Moriah, would most definitely appear to be an express breach of the parent-child relationship between him and his father. What Isaac saw was that his father assaulted him by binding him with corded rope. He then witnessed Abraham unsheathe his knife and approach him with, with a singular determination to kill him. No matter how loudly Isaac yelled for his father to stop, Abraham wouldn't. There wasn't anyone else present that could help Isaac. There wasn't anyone there that could save him from his father's murderous intent. At this very moment, the man that Isaac always thought loved him more than life itself was the same man that intended to do him the most harm. 
What kind of feelings of betrayal could Isaac have felt in that moment? What did fear taste like? And what did it feel like in that instant? How was his belief in his father forever destroyed in that minute? Yes, I know that the Lord was just testing Abraham. He never intended for the brother to actually go through with sacrificing his son. But Abraham never knew that before it came time to sacrifice Isaac. And Isaac definitely didn't, didn't know anything at all concerning this, the sacrifice. He never had any idea that this entire incident was just a test of faith. It looked absolutely real to him. Again, the tendency among the saints is to celebrate Abraham for exercising tremendous faith in the Lord our God. While we're celebrating, we can never forget that the very act we celebrate as an exercise of faith is the same act that likely destroyed the parent-child relationship between Abraham and Isaac. If we study subsequent chapters of Genesis, we're never told that Isaac spent any more time in Abraham's presence until the day Abraham died. In fact, my sanctified imagination leads me to believe that the underlying reason why Abraham sent his servant to bring Rebekah to Isaac as a bride is because Abraham was hoping that Rebekah could serve as both a peace offering and a reconciliation gift to his son Isaac. The father hoped by doing this for his son, the relationship between the two of them could be restored. Amen. So our first point this morning is that Abraham's actions appear to Isaac to be a willful violation of the parent-child relationship. The second point this morning is Abraham's actions appear to Isaac to convey the idea that Abraham loved God more than he loved his son. Amen. The Abraham's Isaac actions appear to Isaac to convey the idea that Abraham loved God more than he loved his son. One of the most difficult things to do as a parent is to explain to our children the difference in the love we have for them and the love we have for the Lord our God. We, spe we spend so much time expressing how much we love our babies that they understandably begin believing that they are the centers of our worlds. Come on now, let's keep it real. The primary reason why many of our children are so spoiled today is because they know that they are loved so much. They are the focal points of so much love that they begin to think that they are the only ones entitled to such love. And when they don't believe that they are still the focal points of our love, that's when the temper tantrums and the hissy fits occur. At some point, though, we all must have the conversations with our babies about God. One part of that conversation involves how much we love the Lord, and at some point, every child listening closely to his or her parent will ask the following question. Mommy or Daddy, do you love me as much as you love God? Quite often, we mooch the answer because in our hearts, we don't ever want our children to think that we don't love them dearly. We end up telling them that the love we have for our God is the same love we have for them, our children. While this is an emotionally, this is an emotionally safe answer, it is an express violation of God's commandments to his followers. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 8 explicitly instructs God's followers to love him with all our hearts, minds, bodies, and souls. We derive from this commandment the requirement that we must love the Lord our God more than we love anyone or anything else. This includes our children. When Isaac saw how determined Abraham was to sacrifice him as a demonstration of Abraham's faithfulness to Elohim, Isaac had to believe that he made the wrong assumption all his life about his father's love for him. He assumed that his father loved him more than anyone or anything. He assumed that nothing would come between him and his father. Isaac assumed that Abraham would rather die than let anyone or anything take his son away from him. Laying there on that altar, bound and helpless to defend himself from his father's murderous intent, Isaac realized the truth. His father did not love him more than anyone or anything else. Isaac loved Elohim more than he loved Isaac. Abraham loved Elohim more than he loved Isaac. And realizing that there was someone that Abraham loved more than he loved his son likely shook Isaac to his core. 
Hear, hear Isaac for a second. I'm not the most important thing to daddy. I'm not the one person or thing that daddy loves more than life itself. I'm not the most treasured and valued thing to daddy Elohim is. Our first point this morning is Abraham's actions appear to Isaac to be a willful violation of the parent-child relationship. Our second point, Abraham's actions appear to Isaac to convey the idea that Abraham loved God more than he loved his son. And our last point this morning is Isaac realized that the only reason why he didn't die that day was because God stopped Abraham from killing him. Isaac realized that the only reason why he didn't die that day was because God stopped Abraham from killing him. You know, it's one thing for Abraham's actions to appear to Isaac to be a willful violation of the parent-child relationship. The same goes for Abraham uh, apparently loving God more than he loved Isaac. But it's quite another thing for Isaac to realize that the only thing that stopped Abraham from killing him was God. Reflection on what occurred at the top of Mount Moriah made Isaac realize just how determined Abraham was to sacrifice him to Elohim. Nothing at all seemed capable of stopping Abraham from carrying out his intentions but the voice of God. Not the love he had for Isaac, not the memories of all the good times he shared with his beloved son, not Isaac's cries to his father not to hurt him or kill him. Not even the memory of the pain I Abraham felt when God directed him to listen to Sarah and to expel his other son Ishmael from his household. Nothing at all seemed to snap Abraham out of his murderous intent. Experiencing this had to do something to Isaac. Realizing that he was just that close to actually dying at his father's hand had to shake the brother down to his core. It literally took an act of God to stop Abraham from carrying out the sacrifice. I don't know about you, but to think that the only thing that stood between me and my enemies or my adversaries attempt to hurt me or worse was God puts me many times in a very introspective mood. It makes me realize just how much I need the Lord in my life. It also makes me realize just how serious my enemy or adversary was when he or she threatened to hurt me. I know that I'm not alone in feeling this. There are other folks who feel the same way as I do on this topic. Now, if this is the way that we feel about our enemies and adversaries attempts to harm us and kill us. How do we think those persons that lived with and grew up under parents that did them harm feel? When these persons hear this story about how Abraham tried to sacrifice his son to the Lord as a demonstration of his obedience and his faithfulness, they don't feel any reason to celebrate. No, they're reminded about how mommy or daddy took actions toward them that hurt them or otherwise subjected them to pain and suffering. They're reminded of an abusive parent, regardless of such abuse was physical, mental, emotional, or sexual. They recall persons that were so hateful and so full of vitriol that they turned such hate and despise on their helpless children. These persons do not read this story with the same understanding as those of us who've never been in a situation or never been in a household where our parents were our greatest enemies. This, this scripture right here triggers terrible memories. It triggers pain. It triggers uh, uh, emotions. It triggers people's mental health issues. Because when they think back on their childhood, they think about the abuser. They think about the uh, one who wanted to hurt them. And what we as Christians must always do, and we've got to be mindful of this, is be mindful that when God is having us minister to people to meet them where they are, Someone that's been abused as a child, someone that's been mistreated as a child, does not want to hear a story about a parent that's going to mis mistreat and abuse his child in order to prove his faithfulness to God. If you tell this story to someone that you are not aware of has, has a history with child abuse, who's been abused as a child, you have turned them off from God. We must realize, amen, I love God. And again, again, don't hear me uh, and don't take, get me wrong. Don't hear me as saying I'm condemning Abraham. I am not. 
nor am I trying to dispute or dispel uh, that Abraham's actions on the top of Mount Moriah were acts of faith. I'm not doing that. Rather, the Lord wants us to know that there is a segment of our society out, the, out there in the world that are the Isaacs from Genesis chapter 22. And when they see and think about their parents, they have one and only one question for their parents. Mama or daddy, why did you do that to me? And you know, brothers and sisters, if we're going to be the ministers of God that God has called us to be, and we're all ministers. If you call yourself a child of God, we're all ministers. If we're going to be the ministers that God has called us to be, then we've got to be sensitive enough to be able to minister to persons who are the Isaacs. To minister them after their parents have tried to harm them the way they have. Amen. Amen. Here, let's do this. Let's have a prayer over our devotional as well as a prayer for persons who are the Isaacs in our world. Trust me, we all know Isaac. Amen. Amen. And, and, I, and our, the Isaac we know doesn't have to be a male. It could be a female. Uh, and so let me make it female. We know Isaac Cena. Okay, or however uh, we are going to name her. We know someone within our six degrees of separation that has suffered at the hands of their parents, who have been abused at the hands of their parents, who have uh, found themselves in a place of pain because the ones that should have loved them are the ones that did them the most harm. Isaac should have never, ever felt this way. It's only because of God's direction to Abraham that Isaac feels this way. And so here, let us do this. Let us not only pray over our devotional, but let's send a prayer up for children that have been abused, or persons that are grown uh, adults now that grew up in households where they are... Uh, uh, well, they had to deal with this. Good morning, Dr. Miller, Reverend Dr. Miller. Why don't you do me a favor while you're on the on here right now, give us one of your prayer requests or a set of your prayer requests. Type it down in the bottom and we'll lift it up once we transition in one second over to the prayer section of our call. Amen. Here, let us go to God in prayer. Dear Father God, creator of the heavens and the earth, God, we come to you right this very instant. Asking you, God, to help us receive this devotional in the spirit, God, that you mean for us to receive it. God, you're dealing with family drama. And God, many times family drama begins with the parents, not the kids. The children didn't ask to be here. The children have no power over life. It's the parents that do. And many times, God, the decisions that we make as parents are more harmful than we realize that they scar, they injury, they hurt, they harm these kids that that carry these scars and these injuries, these emotional, psycho-emotional injuries for the rest of their lives. And God, if we're not careful, if we don't help them deal with them and heal from that, God, they will inflict that same harm, hurt, and injury upon their own children. It becomes a self replicating cycle that is handed down from generation to generation. And Father God, what you want to do through, through this devotional series is make us aware of those family curses, those generational curses that are hurting, harming, and injuring our families for years. Father God, let's be for real. Abuse didn't start last week, last month, or last year. Abuse has been occurring as long as people have been living. But God, just because it's been occurring as long as it has, does that mean, God, we should accept it or allow it to continue to, to, to happen? Instead, God, we ought to be like that angel that showed up on Mount Moriah, at the top of Mount Moriah, telling these persons to stop. Do not lay a hand on these children. Do not harm them. We should be someone's advocates, someone's protectors, someone's defenders. For God, it doesn't take a lot to defend a child. A child is a small person. We are adults. And the truth is, many adults will not do to us what they do to their kids. So if the necessity is finding the strength to speak up and speak out. God, strengthen us right now. God, fill us right now. God, give us what it is we need right now. 
so that God, we may be the instrumentality, we may be the tools, we may be the vessels that break these generational, generational curses today. God, we pray for anyone that has gone through any type of abuse, that has gone through any type of hurt or harm experience while growing up in their parents' households. God, we know that they are broken, but God, we know that you are a, a God that's so awesome that you are a healer, you're a restorer, you're, you're a repairer. You can transition and transform that which is broken into being whole. And so God, we pray right now that you will begin the process, and if you begin, have already begun the process, to continue to maintain the process of transitioning someone from brokenness to wholeness, to making their life what it needs to be so that they may be an effective, efficient, and efficacious servant within the kingdom and within your kingdom. Father God, we know you can do it because God, we know persons as well as ourselves that have been through that. Now, Father God, we are getting ready to transition from the devotional section of our call to the prayer section of our call where we're going to receive from your people their prayer requests, their praise reports, their prayers, their words of encouragement, their te their testimonies, and their witnesses. We pray right now, God, that you give us the sympathy and the empathy necessary to raise these prayer requests, these prayers, these praise reports, these words of encouragement, these testimonies, and these witnesses so that persons are edified and empowered and equipped by participating in this call, that they leave this call differently than they did before they got here. And Father God, we pray that as you equip, empower, and enable uh, and edify persons, that God is able to go out today and able to declare your word with such boldness and such faith that other, people's, other people find themselves drawn to you. And that God, your kingdom, your body continues to grow and expand in this world. Father God, we love you and we thank you. It's in your son's mighty, matchless, marvelous, magnificent name that we do pray. Amen. 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 Praise God. Amen. We are getting. We are now moving into uh, uh, the prayer section of our call. Amen. Praise God. Uh, we're going to lift up your prayer requests, your praise reports, your prayers, your words of encouragement, your testimonies, your witnesses. All you have to do. Uh, to have us lift those up is to share if, share them. If you're on the phone, call the live call, amen, right now. All you have to do, amen, is simply uh, tell us uh, uh, who you are, where you're calling from, and what you want to pray with you for, with you for, or about, amen. If you're afraid that someone may recognize who you are, just give us your name. I mean, just tell us what your prayer request. You don't have to give us your name. You don't have to give us where you're calling from, and we'll lift that up. Amen. Amen. I want everyone to see we, we are on the call. Amen. We're on the call right now. And if you're on the, the Facebook Live, amen, you too can... Uh, uh, sit, submit your prayer requests, your praise reports, your prayers, your words of encouragement, your testimonies, and your witness. Amen. All you have to do is take advantage of that box at the bottom of the screen, and we will most definitely lift up your prayer request. There's no prayer request that's too big, too small. In fact, we've got some very serious prayer requests today uh, that we want to lift up. Amen. And so, uh, <clears throat> let's do that. Let's jump right into it. Amen. Uh, uh, Reverend Miller uh, I asked him to um, put his prayer request down here so that we lift it up. And he has asked that we pray for one of his members. Amen. His member's daughter, his member's daughter has the coronavirus. Amen. Praise God. Uh, we know that God is a healer. We know uh, that God is able to overcome things. We know that God has her because, guess what, persons are are praying for her, persons are interceding on her behalf, and, and we believe that God would direct her and her parent, amen, to the appropriate medical professionals that will help her move through this, uh, amen, this uh, coronavirus, amen, amen. I want to tag Reverend Miller's prayer because I have a member also. Uh, she contacted me last night to tell me that her two-month-old granddaughter, I want y'all to hear this, her two-month-old granddaughter has the coronavirus. Amen. The, the, only, the only thing that is separating, that's sustaining this little girl, uh, amen. Good morning, uh, Sister Peppa. Go ahead, type in your, uh, your 
prayer request down at the bottom of the screen so we can lift it up. The only thing that is my members and her family saving grace at this point is that the baby is asymptomatic. She's not showing any symptoms of the virus. She's been tested positive for it, but she's not showing any symptoms. That 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 is sustaining their hope and their faith that God will bring this tiny child through this experience alive. For those who don't know, one of the most susceptible group to the coronavirus are babies and children. That's because their immune uh, auto immune uh, system, autoimmune system, has not developed fully, and so they're easy victims for uh, the coronavirus. Amen. Uh, so let's lift her up. Let's also lift up any family members who are caring for the baby who may have also contracted the virus from caring for the baby, okay? It's one thing to let the baby live. It's another thing to let the baby live and everyone around the baby dies. Amen. So let's uh, be in prayer for uh, uh, for um, uh, the family that's caring for this small baby. Here, let's go to God in prayer. Dear Father God, creator of the heavens and the earth, God, we come to you right now, touching and agreeing, God, for the safety and the well-being of persons connected to us. Father God, you have blessed Dr. Miller and myself to have members, to have sheep that look to us for spiritual guidance and direction. And God, the coronavirus has hit us in such a way that it has many people on their knees begging you, God, for your immediate intercession, intercession and intervention. That Father God, these persons want to be free of the virus. They know what this virus is and they know what it's doing. They know how lethal this virus is and God they're praying, hoping that this virus does not take them out or those connected to them. Father God, we know that you are a protector from all things. This is not the first pandemic that God that you've had to deal with. This is not the first virus that threatened to kill people that you've had to save us from. In fact, God, if the truth be told, God, there have been many times before where you've had to come in and you've had to eradicate pandemics, epidemics, and viruses and plagues, God, because God, we had no knowledge, we had no ability to do it. And Father God, if you've done it before, if you did it before, we ask and pray and, and exercise faith that you will do it again. That, Father God, you will continue to look out for us. You continue to bless us. You continue to watch over. You continue, God, to protect us from these things that we cannot protect ourselves from. And God, when you heal, when you restore, when you make whole again, when you make us healthy again, God, we will already be praising you for your goodness, your faithfulness, and your mercy, God. That, God, we will not wait until the virus is eradicated to praise you. We will praise you right now. We will praise you in the midst of what we're going through. We will praise you in the midst of our trouble. We will praise you in the midst of our darkness. We will praise you, God, in the midst of everything that's going on. Because, God, as we praise you, God. God, you are motivated to move more and more on our behalf. You are getting the glory you so richly deserve. And so, God, we're ready to glorify you. We're ready to honor you. We're ready to praise you. God, move as you need to move. Father God, we love these persons, these individuals, these members. They are our brothers and our sisters. And God, we pray for them as we would pray for any of our own individual family members. And we ask God that you make a miracle out of these persons. It's in your son's mighty matchless, marvelous, magnificent name that we do pray. Amen. 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 Praise God. Praise God again. We are in the prayer section of pray, prayer section of our call. If you have a prayer request, praise report, prayer, words of encouragement, testimony, witness that you'd like to raise, jump in, give us your name, where you're calling from, and we'll go from there.